in thinking about reform, I think we can learn from Henry Clay, the great Kentucky senator who inspired Abraham Lincoln and uh, promoted the idea of what he called the American system in the early 19th century. Uh, for Clay, the American system consisted of infrastructure, manufacturing, and finance policies. Uh, the federal government would finance large-scale infrastructure policies to improve uh, the economy uh, that states and localities could not do on their own. At the same time, it would promote infant industries uh, by protecting developing technologies and industries from foreign, at that time, British uh, uh, export competition. Uh, and finally, you would have a more nationalized system of finance to replace the very chaotic state-based system that plagued the economy before the Civil War. During the Civil War and Reconstruction, Lincoln and his fellow Republicans uh, put through many elements of this. Uh, in Land of Promise, I argue that the New Deal can be thought of in part as another American system uh, with the interstate highway system and rural electrification being to Franklin Roosevelt what the Transcontinental Railroad and Telegraphs had been, uh, the, this new modern grid uh, for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the Glass-Steagall banking reforms, which lasted up until the end of the 20th century, being the equivalent of the Civil War era financial reforms. Uh, and uh, un during the New Deal period, uh, in the middle of the 20th century, American industry, having become dominant in the world, no longer needed the tariff protection that had been afforded to infant industries. Now they needed access to foreign markets. And so Roosevelt and his successors, quite logically, given the development of the economy, focused on opening up foreign markets to American exports rather than protecting American industries from competition. So, so that's how those three elements were put together uh, in the New Deal version of the American system. The New Deal added something. It added a fourth element to Henry Clay's three, manufacturing infrastructure and finance, and that was innovation. Uh, all the way up until the 1940s, the United States uh, essentially imported inventions from the rest of the world. We don't like to admit this, uh, but the steam engine was invented in Britain. Uh, the internal combustion engine was invented in Germany and perfected in France. Uh, uh, the electrical uh, lighting industry uh, was largely a Western European invention that was uh, adapted and modified by Thomas Edison. It's not invented by him. Uh, uh, and the basis of invention in modern uh, high-tech industries uh, is actually the German research university. It was something that Imperial Germany came up with in the 1880s and 1890s, state-funded R&D. This was something that never really existed on a large scale in the world before. And this inspired the Roosevelt and Truman administrations and their successors to this day to having a role of the federal government, largely through the Defense Department, but also through uh, agencies like the National Institutes of Health, uh, to permanently fund basic science R&D on the theory that companies uh, tend to fund product and process R&D that benefits uh, their particular uh, products. They are not going to take the risk of, say, sequencing the genome uh, or, or uh, uh, coming up with uh, new breakthroughs in, uh, in materials physics, which they may not be able to capitalize. So these basic breakthroughs, according to this view that has shaped uh, U.S. R&D policy now, uh, for better than a half a century, uh, the, f the government should fund basic science and research, largely through major research universities, not directly, though there are some government labs. Uh, uh, and then you, uh, when these become commercialized, then you spin these off to the private sector, where venture capital comes in, people found companies, uh, entrepreneurs figure out how to use these technologies and these materials that uh, the basic researchers have come up with. And this is essentially the story of how we developed uh, nuclear energy, uh, the computer industry, the internet, uh, satellites, uh, the jet engine, all of this, they migrated from government or government-funded R&D labs uh, over a period of decades into the private sector where they spun off new businesses, new industries, uh, and changed society uh, while doing that. So uh, I argue in Land of Promise that if we're going to have a new American system, uh, to use Henry Clay's uh, label, uh, it would have these four elements, not just three, uh, innovation, uh, uh, infrastructure, manufacturing, and finance. And just to uh, give the briefest of overviews of, of all of these, uh, the problem with our innovation system in the early 21st century is that it is too dependent on discretionary spending by the federal government. Uh, whenever there is a panic about the deficit or the national debt, the first thing to be cut 
apart from means-tested programs for the poor, uh, is money for federal R&D. So we need to come up with a system uh, in which R&D funding uh, can be maintained at an adequate level uh, in spite of the constant temptation of Congress uh, to have savings by cutting it. And one of the things I propose, among others, uh, is that we should uh, borrow the money to finance R&D. Uh, states and cities routinely borrow money to finance uh, infrastructure assets like roads and public school buildings and water and sewage systems, uh, which will increase the productivity of the local economy uh, and render benefits to generations and, and pay for themselves over time. If you think of R&D as an asset uh, that is shared by the community and that in increases the productivity of the national economy and the world economy, it is exactly the sort of thing that you should finance by government borrowing uh, through bonds, through uh, in public investment banks. There are various mechanisms for doing this, but there are vast amounts of private capital sitting on the sidelines looking for steady returns uh, and coming up with ways that you can leverage this private capital to invest in long-term government-backed R&D, carried out mostly by research universities and the private sectors. I, I think that, that should be on the list of reforms. If you look at infrastructure, uh, the United States has been spending far less on infrastructure uh, as a, a share of its GDP than many of its uh, industrial competitors, uh, including older ones like those of Western Europe, but also rising countries like China. And again, it, it's not simply a failure to appreciate the importance of infrastructure. It's the way we fund it, uh, which is through discretionary appropriations by Congress. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, highways, they're funded by the gasoline tax, and it's always controversial raising the tax uh, with inflation. Uh, so there's this uh, problem of perpetual underfunding. In my view, we solve the infrastructure finance problem the same way we do the R&D problem. We, we do this by means of borrowing. Uh, it should not be dribbled out in, in dribs and drabs by Congress uh, based on deals among uh, uh, representatives and senators. Uh, there should be a national infrastructure bank or similar public investment banks. Other countries do this. This, this is not a new proposal. This is a tried and true technique used in most of the rest of the developed world. There's a European investment bank, uh, Japan and China. Uh, both have had infrastructure uh, uh, banks and other public purpose banks. So uh, both in the case of R&D and of uh, infrastructure, I think there's a large role for the public to tap into private sector wealth and also uh, sovereign fund wealth of, of various countries like Saudi Arabia and Norway to fund uh, new research, new development, uh, and new infrastructure in the United States. When it comes to manufacturing, uh, the United States needs to rebuild its manufacturing base and maintain a world-class manufacturing base. Uh, that's important, even though it's not going to employ as many people as it did uh, earlier in the industrial era. Uh, manufacturing, nevertheless, uh, is a source of important spillovers to the rest of the economy, both the, the suppliers of the ingredients and goods and components that go into the manufactured goods uh, locally, uh, but also uh, the intellectual property, which increasingly is uh, generated uh, within what's called an industrial commons. That is, there was a myth in the 1990s that you could do all the inventions sitting over here and then all the production could be on the other side of the world. What we've learned in the interim is that there's an interchange which, in, in spite of the supposedly borderless world, still takes place within particular areas where you have agglomerations of firms and of talent, areas like Silicon Valley, southern China. Uh, so that if you have a pure production area, over time, you're going to get the R&D and the development and the, the in creativity and the financing is going to spring up there. Conversely, if you're an older established industrial commons and you lose the production part of it, you're probably going to lose the R&D and the uh, uh, insurance and the financing, and that's going to go too. It's going to follow the production. Uh, so we need a system in which the United States can rebuild uh, a world-class manufacturing base without, however, plunging the world into perpetual trade wars of the kind that existed uh, in the 1930s and, and before World War I. And that's a diplomatic challenge. It's a geopolitical challenge because all of the rising countries like China and India, Brazil, want their share of high value added technologies. Uh, the existing answer of mainstream economists, the market will decide 
uh, is irrelevant because the governments of these uh, rising countries, just like the U.S. government in the 19th century when we protected our infant industries, they're going to say, uh, we don't care where the market says industry should be located. We want a shipbuilding industry. We want a steel industry. You know, we want at least a share of, of the, uh, these high value added industries for our country. So I think we're going to have to rethink our, our uh, two visions of trade, neither of which is uh, desirable. There's the idea that governments pay no attention to the location of industry on the map of the Earth's globe. Uh, that's just politically irrelevant. But at the same time, there's this rival competitiveness ideology that says every country should try to corner the market uh, in as many industries as possible. That leads to uh, uh, the crisis of overproduction and underconsumption uh, because a few countries can run perpetual trade uh, surpluses with the rest of the world. Every country cannot do that simultaneously. Every country cannot sell and refuse to buy. So we need to work out some system in which there's some kind of agreement that all countries have at least shares of these basic uh, technologies that they want represented by industries within their borders. Uh, and finally, when it comes to finance, Alexander Hamilton, the first Treasury Secretary of the United States, creator of the first bank of the United States, uh, said that bank, banking by its nature should be a public utility. Uh, and that was the view of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal reformers. Banking should not be exciting. It should be boring and uh, it should be subordinate to the rest of the economy. So appropriately in my list, finance comes last uh, because it should serve all of the previous things. So our judgment of a financial system shouldn't be whether the banks are big or the banks are small, these kind of peripheral issues. Uh, it, sh it should be whether banking is underwriting R&D, uh, is it underwriting infrastructure, and is it supporting rather than sabotaging a healthy, robust manufacturing base. Uh, if you have a financial system that does that, and it may have elements of public finance, of private finance, nonprofit, we're very in the early stages of that, it probably is not going to look like the Wild West casino financial system that we've had at least in New York and in London uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. It would probably be, if not like the more state-based uh, German and, and Chinese systems of finance, where uh, it's a quasi-governmental uh, entity uh, financing uh, small and medium em enterprises in Germany uh, or industry and, and uh, infrastructure projects in East Asia. That's one model. Uh, another model is uh, the more tightly regulated utility financial system that the United States had uh, from the 1930s all the way up until deregulation in the late uh, 20th century. Uh, but whatever one thinks about the details of these proposals, I, I think the essential point that needs to be made is reform is a system. Now in practice, you're not going to do everything at once. That's unrealistic. It's not even desirable. Uh, but you don't want to be pushing policies which are subverting other policies that you want. So this idea of an American system, of a comprehensive, general, flexible vision of reform, I think is a useful way to organize the conversation about where do we go from here.